Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Galileo scope. What is it? Well, it's a telescope kit, a 50 millimeter F10 refractor that you put together yourself. This was created for the International Year of Astronomy back in 2009, and I did a review back then, which I'll link below. Those were exciting times. The people who made this thing had a couple of stated goals. One was to see the rings of Saturn with a small telescope, and the other was to bring a telescope to the masses at $10. Now, I know some of the people who were involved in the development of this thing, and knowing them, I was pretty sure they were going to get certain things right, and for the most part, I think they did. You can see the rings of Saturn with this. However, the stated goal of bringing this to market at $10 turned out to be just a little bit aggressive and you started to hear that it was going to come out at $15. When it finally did hit the market, it was $20, and I was getting ready to order one, and then I saw they were charging $14 and some change for shipping. Made my finger hover over the mouse just a little bit. But anyhow, I did get a hold of one of these things, and yeah, this thing's pretty good. I remember those times back in 2009 because a lot of people were bringing these things to me either to have me help them put it together or to have me help them try to find things and use it. And it was, times were good. I mean, for around nine to 12 months or so after the introduction of this thing, there was a lot of buzz around this telescope. And then, I don't know, something happened. It kind of went away. I myself forgot about this thing for many years. Well, it turned out in the past year or two, Explore Scientific has revived this model. Yes, it's now $69. They do occasionally run sales, and if you are an educator who buys in bulk, I think you have to buy at least 10 pieces. They'll sell them to you somewhere in the mid-30s. Check Explore Scientific's website for the, for the current deals. Okay, so on to the unboxing here. So the carton here is remarkably compact. It's Hard to believe almost there's a whole telescope in here, but I do want to repeat this is a kit. You put it together yourself, and I mention that because I think it has a tendency to get a little bit lost in the description. So let's go ahead and unbox this. It slides out like this. Another surprise people have when they open this up is the kit is perhaps a little more complicated than what they were bargaining for. There are over 30 parts. The instructions detail over 25 different instructions, and you put everything together yourself, including the lenses for the eyepiece, the objective lens, and everything else. You don't need any tools or adhesive for this. It snaps together. It's held together by O-rings and some end caps. Okay, so here we are again. It's about 10 minutes later. I think most of the time you're going to be spending here is just laying out all, all the parts and figuring out where they're going to go. But as you can see, this is the main optical tube here. These are the O-rings that hold it together. You actually don't need those. This is the draw tube. Those are the O-rings that hold together the draw tube. And again, it does work if you don't have those. This is the eyepiece. I think that's actually pretty cool. You actually put that thing together yourself. And it's not a cheap Ramsden or Huygenian eyepiece. It actually appears to be a plossal design. There's, I don't know if you can see this, there's two doublets that are spaced. It's actually a decent eyepiece. The objective lens is here. This is the Barlow. I would show you that, but I put it together and I'm having trouble taking that thing apart. I, I don't want to break it, so I'm going to leave that assembled for now. But uh, yeah, it takes you about 10 minutes to get to this point. So I've actually come to believe that one of the main benefits of this thing is putting it together. You can make it a family project. And also, I think seeing the various parts of the telescope and how they go together actually helps you. So this is a quarter inch by 20 nut at the bottom here. And that's what holds it onto the tripod or whatever you choose to set it on. This is sighting for your finder.
Okay, so there we go. We have our eyepiece in here. This is the Barlow, which we've left out for now. And this is something I've never entirely understood. It's a display stand. It's a couple of pieces of plastic, and I guess you're just supposed to, I don't know, display that like your sword or something. A little bit of whimsy there, I guess. So here we have the Galileo scope on a tripod, and I'll try to walk you through some of the issues that you might run into. First of all, you have to find something suitable to put it on. The heavier, the better. I noted in my earlier review that something in the four to five pound range for a tripod tends to work well. If you have something even heavier, that works too. So when you select your tripod in your head, you wanna select a head that you can move the telescope by moving the head separately like this, either a pan and tilt head like this. A ball head might work if you can leave the thing on drag. The point is you wanna move the telescope with the head and not by dragging the telescope itself. The reason is because you're gonna twist it. There's only one quarter inch by 20 bolt there. You can shear the housing, this plastic housing that it's around. I've seen it happen. You break that thing and you're kind of done. So the second issue is going to be familiar to anyone who has ever used binoculars. Once the telescope is elevated above around 40 to 45 degrees above the horizon, it gets kind of hard to get down under here to look through the eyepiece. Yeah, you can do it for a while, but after a while for me, if I was looking at something overhead, I would just as soon not look at it, and it is uncomfortable. So this thing does take inch and a quarter eyepieces, so you can swap out your own eyepieces if you want. One thing I really wish that they could have done is made it so that you could use one of these. It's a diagonal, and it makes the eyepiece a lot more comfortable. The problem is there isn't enough in-focus travel. This diagonal consumes a lot of light path, if you look at this, for you to come in enough for you to put a eyepiece in there. And I might suggest if the designers of this thing were thinking of coming up with a Mark II version, that might be something they can fix, and I don't think it would take very much. All they would have to do is shorten the main tube and lengthen the draw tube. I think the total amount of plastic and materials they would use would probably be about the same and you could either include a cheap diagonal or instructions to get one yourself. I think that would probably work. So after finding a suitable tripod and making sure that the object you're looking at isn't too far up, the next thing you're gonna find that's an issue is the finder nibs itself. I showed you those earlier. Yes, you can see them when they're in a nice bright room like this, but when you get outside, those nibs can be a little bit tough to see. You can work around this. So what can you see with this? Well, I think optically, this thing is not bad. I mean, it, I think it's better than the optics on that first scope 76 that I reviewed earlier. That's not a surprise. This is F10 versus F4 on that little reflector. I managed to see the Orion Nebula, the Pleiades. I caught a couple of open clusters. I caught the double cluster. I did see M81 and M82. Those are the two galaxies in Ursa Major. That was tough. Uh, you only have 50 millimeters worth of aperture here. It's not gathering a lot of light. Now, if you want to get creative, you can also do this. Because it has a quarter inch by 20 nut at the bottom, you can thread on a Vixen compatible plate and put it on any mount that you choose, either an Altaz mount or a tracking mount like this one. So in this case, the telescope weighs so little, it's only about 1.6 pounds, and much of that is the plate. This is the first time I think I've ever used this mount and didn't need a counterweight at all. There's nothing here. The weight of the shaft is enough to counterweight the telescope. And in fact, while I was looking through it, I took this, my planetary imager, and put it on the moon. Now, in my review of the Celestron First Scope 76, I noted that it was not fun doing this on that telescope. It was not terribly fun on this one either. The problem is focus. You're drawing things in and out, and it's a friction fit and drawing precise focus is more a matter of luck than anything else. And here we are outside with the telescope. Still can't get over no counterweight on the shaft, but that's the way it works out. I got to wondering, objectively, how good is this thing? Now, if there's anything I enjoy more than a comparison, it's an unfair comparison. So let's go ahead and get unfair. We're gonna pit this $69 Galileo scope against a $1,200 Vixen ED81S apochromatic refractor. A much requested telescope on this channel, by the way. Stay tuned for a review. We had a stretch of excellent weather here in late March of 2021. I took captures of the moon on successive nights with both telescopes. This was not easy with the Galileo scope, but I managed to do it.
Now, nobody expects the Galileo scope to win here. The goal is just to have some fun. I'm not even going to show you which telescope is which. You're, you should be able to figure this out by yourself. I'm just going to label them Exhibit A and Exhibit B. So again, the point here isn't to beat up on the poor Galileo scope, it's just to have some fun. I know, I know, you did your best. We'll have cookies later. So there you have it, a review of the Galileo scope. If you have one of these, let us know how you're doing with it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.